the things we have, uh, we have securities, and we look at the idea of leveraging this technology to say, can we benefit from DLT, blockchain, that kind of technology as a method to tokenize, in a sense, phys real assets, like in the case of securities and so on, and securities trading, can we do that? So at DTCC, I'm not going to cover everything they do here, but they've already got projects in place that have already been publicly announced about ION, which is trying to, in a sense, say we'll settle securities <clears throat> on a blockchain um, automatically and we'll tokenize the securities and settlement through a blockchain as opposed to the current way it's done today. We have other projects at DTCC also based on DLT technology as well. So I won't go into those, but just to say that in the concept of digital assets, if we're an organization responsible for settlement, that means one of the things we're responsible for, not only connecting to all of the marketplaces that trade those assets, but we're also responsible for payments on those assets when they're bought and sold. And you wind up with what I call the custody problem. So wherever you're, whatever stock you own directly or indirectly, somebody is probably a custodian for that stock, you know, some company. And so if you're in the digital asset space, one of the, as a provider, one of the things you have to do is solve the custody problem. How do I, in a sense, custody all of your investments in Bitcoin or whatever it is? Um, so anyway, that said, if you look at the kinds of financial assets involved, you could be talking about Bitcoin, Ether, or some other crypto. You can be talking about things like stable coins, right? that are not as volatile. They're pegged to a, a fiat currency of some type, like it could be Tether, USD coin, or some of the other ones. In our case, we're taking real securities like IBM stock and saying, let's make that, uh, we'll tokenize that. And so that becomes an asset uh, that we're gonna track that way. And then central bank digital currencies, which there are a few of them in the world um, that have been announced. Most of them haven't been successful to date, but they're out there. Um, I can't remember if it was Nicaragua, one of the uh, Central American countries has already done that. Uh, they said that they made legal tender out of a digital currency um, down there, um, which unfortunately hasn't worked out well to date, but it doesn't mean that it won't in the future. Um, so central bank digital currencies, um, lots of countries are looking at that. Lots of companies, countries have already gotten experiments, and most of them are farther ahead than the U.S., I'll say, the bigger economies that are focused on it. Um, in the U.S., as often as the case in financial innovation, um, as a government, we tend to lag behind. So individual companies in the U.S. are in innovative. But at the government level, we're usually not a leader in pioneering new financial products or services. Um, physical asset proxies, that's another thing. So in the case of, I worked with Rhode Island, there's a session, the uh, next session that I'm doing with Liz Tanner. She's the Secretary of Commerce for the state of Rhode Island. She actually pioneered a digital identity um, system for the state as an MVP. It's not in production yet, but we had a very successful MVP. But she, as the Secretary of Commerce, there's a whole bunch of use cases in the state that we don't cover for things like land titles, cars, vehicle registrations, all that kind of stuff. They're easy candidates uh, to use the same technology and the same services. And by the way, the stuff in the state of Rhode Island was all built using the Hyperledger platform. So Indy, Aries, Ursa. And then um, I was so brilliant as the project manager that I said, hey, if we stole all that, why don't we steal more? So we went and stole everything from British Columbia that they produced, which is brilliant work. So we took the whole virtual organizations network and started as our starting point. Instead of down here, we grabbed all that too. And so it made the whole licensing problem super simple. So it took um, an Infosys team four months from start to finish to get the whole thing up and running in the state, which is pretty amazing. Um, but again, that was the head start, not only Hyperledger, but British Columbia, Trust Over IP, that whole organization, open sourcing everything, made a world of difference. So it's a commercial for how brilliant I am that I knew that I should be going after open source. So uh, that's, my, that's my resume, is I'm smart because I know how to shop rather than build something from scratch. Um, but service as asset, uh, asset proxies, so events, that kind of stuff makes sense. Um, rights assets as well. So in the arts world, we have, you know, rights to read a book, uh, music, that kind of thing, the Kindle stuff and all of that. Um, so, whoops, there goes my screen. Um, tokens and wallets. So we talk about digital assets. We tokenize them. Usually we issue tokens and we have a whole token taxonomy. Um, so there's the, I forget the association, the whatever it is, Internet Work Association that owns the token taxonomy. And there's a whole thing for different uh, token types, not just fungible, non-fungible, but they have different token types to find. 
We also have different types of digital wallets out there um, that you can store in files on your phone or enterprise wallets that go onto an enterprise. But those enterprise wallets can store different types of token types, digital credentials, certificates, all that kind of stuff. They're designed for that. And you have different types of wallets with different capabilities and also different strengths and weaknesses out there. So I've had friends that have had like a MetaMask wallet and say, ooh, all my NFTs got stolen the other day. Yes, that does happen. So um, any financial system, whether it be digital or not traditional, always has a risk of theft and loss and that kind of stuff. And we, the difference is the better ones actually have insurance. A pretty cool idea. How would it be? Isn't it nice that some of the things are insured? So as an example, DTCC, when we settle trades, once we receive a trade, if we have received a trade and not settled it, we actually insure that for loss, in a sense. So if for some reason it couldn't be settled, we're covering that trade, which is a, uh, it should make all of you breathe easier about your 401ks, um, a little bit, a little bit anyway. Uh, we can't stop the market from going up and down. We don't help with that at all. But um, it's important to think about risk and how you mitigate risk in this world. So fungible tokens, um, many sessions have already talked about that. They're all the same type. So one Bitcoin isn't worth more than another Bitcoin, for example. A non-fungible token, you think of things like works of art that are unique or um, you know, different domain names on the internet. I have a couple of domain names. I can sell those. They have different market values and so on. I could issue tokens on those if I wanted. Uh, Anthony Day from IBM gave us a quick chart here that I included in the handout on Ethereum token standard types. These are just the I'll call it common ones that are out there. There's some additional ones that they're inventing. But the ERC-20 was for fungible tokens like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, 721 for non-fungible tokens. 1155 says here's a token standard that's a little more performant than those two, and it combines the capabilities of both of those to be more creative. 4626 actually dealt with vaults because we now, in our case as a custodian, we're gonna say we're gonna store stuff in vaults. And so there should be a standard around that. And there's some newer token standards as well on trying to improve over 1155 for certain what I call derivative financial in instruments like options, you know, things like warrants that have callable rights and all of that. So this token, the token types, token standards are gonna to continue to evolve. There's no question of that. Token economy, um, I'll grab some better ideas from Andy Martin at IBM who has been tracking the space for probably four or five years in detail if you follow him on LinkedIn. But we tokenize digital assets. On the left there, you can see features of a token economy is you have digital assets represented by a token. They can be represented by anything. These could be physical assets. So in the manufacturing space or supply chain, we represent real products and things with tokens now uh, to make them easy to track and trade on a, a digital model. Digital wallets, we talked about those. Blockchain or DLT is a distributed ledger of permanent transactions on a network. So we already all know that that's where we're here. Smart contracts are just a program that executes on a blockchain or DLT that usually enforces contract terms between different parties. So when I trade an asset like a Bitcoin from you to me, there's rules around that governance and so on. If I buy something, sell something, create something, whatever, all of those smart contracts usually have some sort of a, I'll call it governance set of terms or regulations that govern how that smart contract is supposed to work. And then marketplaces. So I built a couple of marketplaces for energy trading, one for vehicle identity and a few others uh, based on Hyperledger Fabric. Um, there's other blockchains, Corda. There's um, you know Ethereum We're using the Basu clients here. There's lots of options within the Hyperledger community and even more blockchains out, outside of Hyperledger. So we have lots of different marketplaces built on lots of platforms. Um, and some of the other sessions here on Cactus and some of the other things We'll talk about the idea that these blockchains don't interoperate well for the most part. And so there's different models on how to do that. I'll get into one of the examples we had at DTCC where we were working on uh, this model for Project Lithium on CBDC, but you'll see the idea that there's two different networks operating and somehow you've got to, in a sense, have transactions across two networks. Um, anyway, in the token economy, as Andy Martin summarizes it, you've got the digital assets, you've got smart contracts blockchain, and actually what Andy points out, since his background is an accountant, he says that really blockchain, the point from his perspective, blockchain is primarily um, a governance system. From my perspective, 
as an engineer, and I'm a data engineer um, by trade, you know, for many years before I came into blockchain, is what's different is I look at blockchain as data engineering across a network, except that we're also adding trust engineering on top of that, and that's a big difference. So as a data engineer, all I ever worried about is, do I have good data, and did I send him good data? If I was happy that I sent good data, my responsibility ended there. I didn't give a damn what happened to him. It was his problem as far as I was concerned. But in the real world, we always find that we had data problems all over the place with the way we shared data and everything else. And so DLT offers, I'll call it a better trust model, uh, not only a better integration model in some cases for use cases, but a better trust model as well. So anyway, that's the view of the token economy. If we take a look really quickly, so how does this work? In the industry, we have banking, we have exchanges, and we have custodians, if you will. So banking, digital banking, there's actual real digital banks out there, uh, uh, Time, New Bank, BitBank, and so on. My nephew, actually, uh, is the chief Bitcoin officer for BitBank, so he has the responsibility of making sure that I think it's 3% of the world's Bitcoin is properly managed in his bank. And so he's the guy that writes the... Um, He's a Bitcoin committer and an Ethereum committer, so he wrote the Ethereum, some of the Ethereum wallet code. But the people that run those banks tend to be very technical uh, in what I call the DeFi space and coming up with what I call new innovations on wallets and so on. Um, existing banks, though, now, over the last couple of years, really are seriously interested in saying, hey, you know, in the case of DTCC, we've always traded securities, but we now want to be in digital assets too. Our customers do anyway. And if you're Citibank or JP Morgan or one of the larger U.S. banks, you're going to say, hey, we don't want to have our customers go somewhere else to buy and sell digital assets. We want them to do it through us. So one way or another, Citibank and others are now saying, hey, we've got to reach out and be able to be marketplaces for digital assets, not just traditional ones as well. So uh, exchanges, of course, are online markets like Coinbase and others where you can actually go buy and sell e Ether, Bitcoin, or any other kind of cryptocurrency. And then finally, you have custody services that are sometimes independent of both the banks and the exchanges. And custody services that exist out there like Fireblocks, Copper, Ledger, Anchorage, they're all different. Some of them actually are registered uh, custodians in different legal jurisdictions, and other ones really give you a framework um, in a sense, but don't take legal responsibility for custody of those assets. So there are differences in the custodians in terms of the services they provide. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing to go through and look at them. Um, so the question, there's a lot of questions. If you're going to be dealing in this space from a financial services perspective, I've got a long list of questions. I won't go through those individually. But um, you basically have to ask what, what you're investing in. Do you know wh what your providers can be trusted with? So at DTC right now, we're looking at some of the outside service providers in terms of their capabilities, and we're asking a lot of these questions um, about what they can or can't do, whether or not um, they're unregulated or regulated. There's benefits to both. So sometimes it's nice when somebody takes legal responsibility, but the truth of it is if you're dealing with a customer and I have his accounts or his securities, and the, there's a contractual legal relationship between him and my company, the fact that I'm using a service provider and they're insured isn't really going to help me at the end of the day when I have a legal obligation to him. Uh, in most cases in the U.S., uh, the fact that the uh, custody provider may be regulated and or insured to some level isn't going to protect him and other customers from making claims directly against me. So um, a lot of times, I'll quote the advertising uh, is better than the reality, if you will, of what a digital custody provider can do for you. Um, so we talked about that. We'll talk about taxation. So because we're in the world of finance, every government only exists for a first purpose is collecting your money. They have other motives in mind, but the first thing is we need your money so that we can do anything else that we want to accomplish. So understand that taxation is, I'll call it, a primary driver of every strategy by every government. And governments actually compete with each other, right? So you have foreign countries competing with the U.S. So if you are, as an example, if you're somebody in the U.S. and you've done well and you want to retire and you have money, there's lots of countries that would love to see you move there and bring your assets with you and spend your money over there as opposed to staying in the U.S. So they provide strong, I'll call it economic incentives, a lot of times around taxation and other things, to help attract business. Um, and the same thing in the United States, you see that one state competes against another for sure 
uh, trying to get, in a sense, business and, in a sense, residents to move there. So it's kind of like if you look at, uh, in the U.S., we compare California and Texas over the last few years, there's a big migration out of California and a big migration into Texas on the part of businesses and so on, and residents as well. So anyway, people, organizations are subject to taxes by jurisdiction. We have governments, tax laws in effect are uh, obviously, most of you know how complex they can be and also how, in a sense, illogical they can be, but they're, they're legal. So it doesn't matter how illogical it is. If it's been passed and it uh, hasn't been and successfully um, defended itself against any challenges in court, you'd say it doesn't matter how complex they are, they're legal and they're required to comply with. But taxes obviously are based on income, property, sales, specific taxes, gas, alcohol, tobacco, anything the government wants to get you for. They can get you for walking as a tax if they chose to. Um, they just have to figure out a way to measure it effectively. So governments do differ on how to tax. There's no consistency. And so I guess your opportunity as an individual or a business is to say, where do I want to locate and what jurisdictions do I want to be subject to? You see all the time, you know, companies like Amazon say, well, we, we don't really have what they call nexus in this state. We're just shipping stuff through there, so you can't really tax us for it, those kind of things. Um, they do pay sales taxes, but they do try to avoid um, I'll call it certain other kinds of regulations and taxes where possible. So that happens all the time in the U.S. So as I said, the U.S. is kind of strange. There's other large or, um, countries that also have states, if you will, um, who also, in a sense, wind up competing internally with each other, I think. Uh, one of the things the U.S. is doing, has anybody heard of the global minimum tax? It's a great idea that we had here. It's like, okay, so in the U.S., we'd like to raise everybody's taxes. What we noticed is you all in the front row want to leave and go to places that have lower taxes. So the brilliant idea is we said, hey, let's have a global minimum tax so that every country has to charge at least 15% of your income as a base minimum tax. And if we do that, then you'll be less likely to want to leave the U.S. and I can raise taxes. So it's a fairly transparent scheme. But uh, the current administration has decided to push a global minimum tax. So it's no surprise uh, that they want to do that. It hasn't passed, obviously. Uh, most countries are resistant to the idea. They come back to the U.S. and say, no, that, le that takes away our availability to compete effectively. So countries um, on taxation are classified, regulated on digital assets, and they're all over the place right now. So most countries haven't passed strict laws yet on regulating dig digital assets. Some have. Some have outlawed, you know, things like cryptocurrencies. Other ones have said that they're fine as legal, you know, um, uh, assets and so on. In the U.S., um, we even have fights in our own government, which is kind of interesting. So the CFTC says that they think cryptocurrency should be a commodity, and there's a new draft bill uh, by Senator Loomis and Gillibrand that is saying that they fundamentally agree that cryptocurrency should be treated as a commodity like gold or wheat or something else. Uh, and that's how they should be regulated and taxed and so on. And then the SEC with uh, Gary Gensler, uh, who's the chairman there, says, no, no, no. Based on the behavior of how certain cryptocurrencies are actually used, they're really more of an investment and they should be treated like stocks, investments like an IBM or, or Google or any other stock. And so they should be taxed using capital gains taxes and all that. And so there's actually a lot of disagreement within the U.S. government uh, at the federal level on how to do this. And so recently there was a thing where SEC actually has um, put out a, um, I'll call it a, uh, uh, it wasn't a study. It put out a finding, uh, I say, that there were nine cryptocurrencies that they felt were violating federal security policies. So none of that's resolved. And, of course, the, secure, the cryptocurrencies, a couple of them come back along with Coinbase the Exchange and said, no, we're not. We're really cryptocurrencies, and that's how we are. So these things are, I'll call it, up in the air right now. U.S. Treasury uh, in the U.S. has a responsibility for, in a sense, printing our money. Uh, through the U.S. Mint, so they control the actual fiat currency. So if you have a $50 bill or a $20 bill or whatever, U.S. Treasury was responsible for that. On the other hand, when we look at a digital dollar or central bank digital currency, if that were to happen in the U.S., where is that going to come from? Most likely, and I say likely because it's not law yet, the Federal Reserve will have the responsibility to manage that. So there's been opinions that the Federal Reserve should control that, but there is no law that says it has to be done by the Federal Reserve. So 
Um, they have been, in a sense, investing in a digital dollar since 2017 that I'm aware of, maybe even before that. So innovations and securities. So a couple of things, DeFi finance, we've talked a little bit about that. But um, basically, it's all these new financial products and services built on tokens using smart contracts, blockchain. And what they're trying to do, as you hear on the theory, is that we're going to, in a sense, disintermediate the existing financial um, system uh, and try to get rid of it. So there's a, in life, there's always a theory on something and then the reality that doesn't always line up. So the theory is that all of these financial intermediaries are, in a sense, unproductive, inefficient, um, can't be trusted, and they cost too much to uh, use. So we should get rid of them all and replace with just peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And so when you look at the systems that are out there in the DeFi world today, and good examples would be like Uniswap or something like that, they're not purely decentralized, but they're close to the theory of decentralization. The reality is you have to still, it's he and I can't trade uh, cryptocurrencies directly. We have to use a platform like uh, Uniswap to do that. So are we 100% decentralized? No. And is Uniswap perfectly decentralized as a network? No. But they, they attempt to be, let's put it that way. So Uniswap might be a good example of something that's highly decentralized as an exchange, but a lot of the other ones, like Coinbase and so on, aren't even close to that, and they don't pretend to be. They're just exchanges for a cryptocurrency. And in fact, they have more, much more of the market than something like Uniswap. So they're, again, the theory doesn't line up with the ability to execute well all the time, or the ability even to be trusted. So that's a big problem. And it's actually a problem for consumers because it makes choice difficult. You know, most of us, like me, I think most of you are like me, you're lazy. Lazy people don't want to make tough decisions. I don't want to think about it. I just want it to be easy. But unfortunately, the complexity of the DeFi marketplace and the, even the traditional financial marketplace is complex enough that it makes making good decisions difficult. So one of the challenges is we have know your customer, anti-money laundering rules, OFAC compliance uh, for foreign asset accounting and control. Um, and so on. So all of those regulations apply in the U.S., and certainly most European countries have the equivalent of those regulations in place. So whatever you're doing in the financial space, all of the providers who are in the financial network have those responsibilities. And so when you have other exchanges, uh, and crypto exchanges, they try to run away from that where they can, but in reality, many of them have started to accept the idea that they will be regulated and that they have to comply. So. Some of them have, in a sense, avoided that, and other ones have said, no, finally, if we get, um, if we comply with the existing regulations in certain jurisdictions, we're m more likely to be accepted as a place to do business with than if we avoid those regulations where there's more risk. So that's a, a big challenge right now. Also, we have, in the financial world, insurance payments and loans. So everybody's talked about cross-border payments or remittances from one country to another. That's one use case. But any type of payment, loans um, also fall in this category, insurance as well. Asset management of any kind of asset. And then digital identity and credentials. So you know, most of you, beyond having some sort of legal identity, whatever country you're in, you also have a, maybe a degree from a high school or a college. You have licenses for your vehicle, maybe licenses to operate in your profession and so on. So all of those kind of um, digital identities and credentials are important um, to track as well. So governments try to react and be innovative. And if you look at it, I guess maybe I'll say no surprise, uh, smaller countries tend to innovate faster than larger country, uh, countries on average for sure. And so um, in my case, you know, Liz Tanner, who I worked with at Rhode Island, um, led me to find out that Estonia was one of the leaders on the planet in trying to do digital government for more than 20 years now. Um, other places, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, they have one of the most innovative uh, financial uh, innovation laws uh, focused on blockchain. They were smart enough to even future-proof their Blockchain Act, which is pretty interesting compared to what the U.S. has drafted. And then Asian countries have also left, led a lot on crypto. So Singapore, Japan, uh, where my nephew is, Dubai, some of those other ones have certainly done more on crypto as well, on regulation and support. <clears throat> and EU, e, uh, European Union has been a leader on studies and regulation. As they say, Europe is famous for regulating everything first and then letting somebody else innovate it. <clears throat> so there's the... Uh, 
uh, the uh, European Central Bank is, has a lot of authority over regulating uh, financial systems in the EU. The World Economic Forum also provides studies on a lot of these financial and digital asset issues. Uh, I also am part of the European Blockchain Observatory and Forum, and we wind up doing research supports, uh, research reports on blockchain initiatives in the financial sector and other areas. Our reports are just reports <coughs> that are publicly available, but those reports wind up being input to the European Council when they consider legislation that they want to draft. <coughs> And then finally, the big thing on innovation was the U.S. Executive Order on Responsible Development of Digital Assets back in March of this year. So the Biden administration issues this executive order, <coughs> which sounds very strong in what the order was, but effectively the order didn't do anything except it told everybody in the federal government, all the agencies, with the exception, I think, of the U.S. Army and the Navy, everybody else had to study what digital assets were and how they should be managed and regulated in the U.S. So there was, it's a fairly long order, but that's the net impact of it. There's also, which is pretty cool, um, somehow I've got to find a way to get this handout to you. See these purple things? Those are all hyperlinks that actually worked if you had a real handout. So I'll apologize in advance. I have a handout which somehow didn't get distributed through uh, the conference, but um, We'll find a way to get it to if you don't have it within a week or something. Then I'll say just get me on LinkedIn and I'll give you, you know, the handout with the links. But what's really cool, this group has actually got a CBDC tracker. So if you said I want to know around the world where is central bank digital currency in each country and what projects are going on, this group has done a pretty good job of keeping current on that, which is nice. It makes it easy. And then um, this other group uh, tracks digital identity projects, and there's a sort of a global map, and you can see where those are as well. <clears throat> so now we'll take a look at some stuff. This is one project I was associated with at uh, DTCC. There's something called the Digital Dollar Project, which to the credit of the, found, there's a Digital Dollar Foundation, and Accenture, who's here as a partner, actually did a phenomenal job. The two of them got together, and they said, hey, if the US is ever gonna do central bank digital currency right, they sort of need to know how it should work before they try to draft the legislation to do it. So with that kind of motivation, what they did is they created this project, and this is Chris Giancarlo, who's the director of the foundation, talking about the digital dollar. Um, in a sense, he's talking about the value the digital dollar would have for the U.S. economy, which is one aspect of it. But there's more to it than just that, in terms of what the ability, uh, the value it could be to our community as a whole. And same thing for any country that does a central bank digital currency. Jen Lasseter uh, is the executive director of the Digital Dollar Project, and she actually manages the operations. And then there's an advisory group, participants, and pilot partners to look at actually what the, both the challenges and the opportunities of doing a digital dollar in the U.S. are. So uh, our company, DTCC, got together with the Digital Dollar Project and said, hey, uh, you guys have a... Uh, bank, you have a use case for in the financial system for doing security trades. So since we manage the security trades in the U.S., we'll partner with you on a project, which we did called Project Lithium, uh, to in a sense look at using a uh, CBDC network to pay for security trades that are settled on our network. So we already have Project Ion, which does in a sense um, tokenized security settlement of trades that's running in parallel today to the current settlement network in production. So that's ION. So we said, okay, let's take ION that already works and let's imagine what a CBDC payment network would look like from the Federal Reserve if it were operational. So the tough part of this is there isn't such a network because there can't be one until they legislate it, right? So the problem, the law doesn't exist, but they said, let's go ahead and make the investment to figure out if there was a network, make some assumptions about it, understand how it works, what the limitations are, and what the challenges are. And then from that, we can figure out what, in a sense, of, to, in a sense inform what the um, 
Federal Reserve should do for that particular use case when they come up with a network. So it was a good idea, uh, very challenging to figure out what the Fed might do in the future, but they, the project collectively made some very good assumptions about how that settlement might occur. So um, the key thing was we wanted that the CBDC payments would be on a Federal uh, Reserve network that would run the CBDC side. We already have a, um, a trade settlement network over here, so now we're using a second network for payments. So that was the concept. And so it would look something like this, conceptually, right? So if you say, we already have, I'll quote, the DTC network that does settlements, and it does more than just custody, it does payments of all kinds. But over here, we're saying, if the payment network is gonna be the Federal Reserve instead, how is that going to work? You're going to have two separate networks that have to talk to each other. And so when we looked at that, we know, in a sense, what our DLT platform is. But we couldn't assume the Fed is going to use our platform, so we can't assume that they're going to talk, you know, in a sense, at a blockchain to blockchain level. So in effect, we said, okay, we're going to implement a blockchain on their side, one on our side, but they can't, we can't assume that they're going to talk directly at the blockchain level. So we said the lowest common denominator is just to use APIs to talk, which is fine. So for the time being, until you know different, we're using APIs to communicate. But the idea being that a seller has his securities. If I'm selling IBM stock, it's in my custody bank at Fidelity, and the buyer, his custody bank might be Vanguard. So DTCC has to transfer the IBM stock that's sold from Fidelity over to Vanguard. And we already do that. At the same time, uh, we're saying, but the payment, in a sense, from the buyer who bought the IBM stock, his payment bank might be Citibank, and his, the seller, um, my bank, since I sold the IBM stock, might be Bristol County or something like that. So there's this banking network here the Fed has to run that connects all this stuff for the payment of CBDC to pay for the stock that's sold. Does that make sense to everyone? Conceptually, it's pretty straightforward. It's not a complicated problem in that sense. And like anything, because you're not doing a simple asset swap, you've got multiple parties here, as you can see. So there's four banks involved, two networks, and you're really doing two different assets. One asset you're swapping is securities. The other asset you're swapping is payment. So people say, oh, Bitcoin, it's just an unspent transaction model. That solves everything. Well, it doesn't in this case because you've got two different swaps that, in a sense, have to be coordinated. And so the problem is I've got two swaps and four banks, and the question is, what if, uh, in my case, Bristol County, a uh, small bank, it's not Citibank or J.P. Morgan, what if they don't fulfill their side of a swap, right? You know, and the other swap does occur. So in a sense, how do you, in a sense, solve what I call the problem of swapping assets? And the real issue is you have to have some way of doing what I call custody, right? It, it's a trusted model for that. That's the whole point. So the idea being, again, using the example, that you're going to go through this flow to, in a sense, do the, uh, you know, two different, um, two different swaps. So that was DTCC uh, and the idea of trying to do a central bank digital currency. So finishing that, that was just a test. The test went well for what it's worth. And so now they're writing up a report on that, and that's the status of that project. There's also something called Project Hamilton, which is a different project from the Federal Reserve. And that one was actually pretty interesting because what they were doing there was trying to test capacity. So what they did is they came up with two models. And they said one model, they didn't even use a standard blockchain. They didn't use Ethereum or Fabric or anything. They said, no, no, we're going to build something from the ground up that's super simple. It's not a real production environment. But we're going to build something on level DB with the idea that we can compare what a blockchain model is, where you order the blocks, you know, transactions go into blocks that are ordered on a network, and we're gonna compare that to what if you just took a database and said every transaction's guaranteed, but we're not gonna order them in blocks at all. And what they found was, for the same transactions, they could get 160,000 transactions a second in their test network, but if they only did a two-phase commit and forgot what they call the atomizer that ordered them, they could get 1.7 million or 10 times faster just by doing two-phase commit across a distributed network, which was a good finding to see because it tells you, okay, if you're thinking about the CBDC network, how would you engineer it, in effect, uh, for performance? And then finally, a couple other areas of innovation. The, uh, there's a, something called the FedNow um, network, 
earlier there was a Fed coin. Um, that was an earlier project. Way back in 2017, the Boston Federal Reserve created something called the Fed coin as a test model. That didn't go anywhere, but it did set sort of the foundation for some of these other projects. But the Fed now network, there's a new network coming from the Federal Reserve that's supposed to be a faster version of what they call the Fed wire network. So major banks are connected on the Fed wire network in the US. Uh, and it does what they call ACH transfers from one bank to another overnight kind of thing. And the idea with Fed now is it would be a faster network, more inclusive, bring in more banks, credit unions, and kind of thing. And, and who knows, maybe organizations could be directly part of that network as well. So anyway, the idea being the FedNow network um, is coming in place. It's supposed to arrive in 2024 in production. But you know, th those are always dates are subject to change. Um, the bigger thing is one of the, uh, in a sense, board members of the Federal Reserve uh, Brainerd said that, you know, the real issue is they're trying to understand whether or not a CBDC payment would make things, a payment system would make things safer, simpler, or more secure, and what other risks might it impose, you know, over the current systems we already have. So all of that is the research they're working on, and they're trying to figure out, as they say, what kind of guardrails do they need to establish, what kind of regulations. And I will say that digital dollar project uh, that Accenture is one of the sponsors on, is doing a really good job on trying to figure out what that landscape is. Um, so that's really where the value point is. Consumer protection matters. Um, everybody's aware, I believe, of the general data uh, uh, privacy regulations in the EU, uh, in a sense, passed several years ago. That was a model for everybody else. The US now has some privacy laws in place as well. Um, but there's all these areas of uh, data privacy, right? So your data is exposed everywhere, not just on the internet, not just to Google, but everywhere else. Uh, everybody collects your data when they don't need all that. When I go to a bar to get a drink, I have to show my driver's license, I'm sharing data I don't need to share. Um, all they need to know is that I'm of legal drinking age, um, you know, in that state, wherever it is. Instead, I wind up sharing more data. So privacy is a big issue. And consumer data protection, certainly in the financial services world and digital assets matters as much as it does anywhere else. So the idea that GDPR put out is that there are some principles for what they call data controllers. Anybody that collects data, has access to data, or manages data on your behalf has these responsibilities. That their, their principles on controlling the data is the collection of the data um, needs to be lawful, fair, and transparent. Uh, so they, in a sense, attack companies that aren't following those policies today. There has to be a limitation of purpose. They, they can't just randomly collect data. If you're trying to figure out uh, whether or not I can drink in your bar, you're not, a, you're not allowed to ask me, you know, do you have a job? How much do you make a year? Those would be invalid questions for that purpose. Um, data minimization, don't collect more data than you need to fulfill the responsibility. Obviously, accuracy. How long do you hold the data? You know, do you keep a copy of that or not? Um, integrity, confidentiality, ensure that nobody else, if I show you that I'm over 18, make sure that nobody else can see that. And accountability, if you've collected that data, you're responsible for it. So all those principles make uh, sense for managing data uh, privacy for sure. And in the space of central bank digital currencies, those same things you can assume will apply as, in a sense, principles for managing that. So if I look quickly at legislation trends, what I can see is uh, Europe, again, uh, has something called markets and crypto assets as a regulation that has passed in the EU. It's not in force yet, but it has passed. And the European Commission's MICA proposal is a framework to regulate, um, I'll call it crypto assets, and uh, the service providers in the EU, EU under a single licensing regime. And that's actually pretty complex, because like the US, like the US, the challenge of it is, um, like the U.S., the challenge of it is that the states in the U.S. have jurisdiction, for the most part, over banking and insurance, not the federal government, except when the federal government in the U.S. passes a law that oversees that or supersedes that. The same thing applies in the EU. The countries have responsibility for issuing licenses and regulations around financial systems that may differ from one country to another, but if the EU has set a law that applies across the EU, EU then it supersedes, supersedes those local regulations. So the challenge of MICA is that 
as they say, they want to give legal certainty for crypto assets that are not covered under existing laws, makes sense, establish uniform rules, so on. Um, but again, the, the phrase is not covered by existing law. So sometimes there is an existing law. The nice part about MICA is that it's not attempting to replace all that. Those are some of the features of MICA, but that's what MICA is about. Um, Wyoming in the US, I'll, I'll give you the slide deck to read through that, but they were a leader in trying to say, we're a state, we're gonna take over crypto assets as an area that's not governed. And they passed some laws back in 2019 that were very innovative. They looked at what wasn't covered and said, we'll take that. So Wyoming managed digital assets. The last thing is the US executive order on that. And that was the attempt I mentioned earlier, where in a sense, the federal government is telling all of the agencies in the government that we want you to go through, look at digital assets and figure out how they should be regulated. The most interesting part of that law was, or part of the executive order was, it's like giving a teacher giving you a homework assignment saying, here, I want you to turn in a term paper, but by the way, a term paper that includes these facts, I'm gonna give it an A. So they sort of told you what the right answer was. They basically said that for digital assets that are similar to traditional financial assets like security, stock, derivatives, whatever it is, they should follow, if they're in the same business, the same risks and the same rules, they should follow the same regulations. So in a sense, even though they were asked to study these, the departments already know what a good answer looks like if you're working in one of those departments. The Loomis bill, as I said earlier, all that does is map back to the CFTC rec recommendation that says take those digital assets and make them, in a sense, managed as commodities. So that's really it. We've covered quickly everything. So we, this is a set of takeaways. I think the biggest thing is the fact that um, in the US and in the EU, central bank digital currencies look likely they are going to happen. Um, how they're going to get regulated is not clear. The fact that they are going to get regulated is clear at some point. The other thing is both EU and US are working on building the infrastructure needed to do that correctly. They're both doing studies in a variety of different ways to figure out what makes sense for a central bank digital currency and digital assets. Um, what you are seeing is there are some things that are saying certain things are now, um, in a sense, uh, clearer about what's gonna get regulated for what it's worth. So that's the end of it. I wanna thank you all for um, going through. I'll call it a long presentation on digital assets and legislation, but really the legislation stuff to net it out is really just a risk model. Where are we now? What's likely to happen? And we're likely to see with some of the work that's been done from both some of the agencies and some of the private things like digital dollar projects, we're getting a sense of what a central bank digital currency would look like in the US. <clears throat> and in the EU, EU, we're also getting an idea of what that would look like for EU as well. So with that, I want to stop. Time's up. So I want to thank you all, and uh, good luck with your digital wallet <clears throat> and your digital dollar.